administrative comments and notices, and then we will uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. John Gore, and then turn the microphone over to Dr. Gore. Um, Dr. Heckers, the CME Activity Director, has no financial relationships related to the contents of this activity. This activity does not receive any commercial support and is funded solely by the Department of Psychiatry. The presenter has not disclosed any potential financial relationships related to the content of the activity, and if there are any conflicts, they will be disclosed during the course of the presentation. There will not be any mention of off-label or investigational use of drugs. You may receive CME or CE credit uh, for this activity, but in order to do so, you will need to text the number displayed on the screen. You must text that number within the next 24 hours. So Jenny has the, the QR code posted on the screen and you will be able to reach it through her on the uh, chat question and answer, or is it the chat box? Okay. Finally, please mute your audio channel. Uh, Dr. Gore will take questions at the end of the presentation, and you may open your microphones at that time. Uh, but the best way to do that is to enter your questions into the questions and answers at the bottom of your screen, and he will take those in order of receipt at the end. Okay, uh, Dr. Gore is our speaker for today. Uh, he received his bachelor's and his PhD in physics, uh, and then was working at TEM Industries and decided to apparently go back to school and receive a law degree. Uh, he then w worked at the Hammersmith in medical physics for a number of years until 1982 when he crossed the pond and moved to Yale where he became professor of diagnostic radiology, director of MRI research, professor of applied physics, and a number of other, uh, had a number of other responsibilities. In 2000, he was recruited to Vanderbilt as the chancellor's university professor. Um, he has been extraordinarily productive. He lists about 700 uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts, a uh, hundred book chapters. He is currently the PI on five NIH grants. Uh, and just looking at the published papers over the past year will give you a, an idea. He's a true polymath. Uh, what you have are a number of papers on different topics. For example, developing new methods for use in the diagnosis and in monitoring treatment response in renal disorders, cancer, lupus, and in the use of artificial intelligence in medical imaging. He uh, does not only work here at Vanderbilt, but he is active in uh, service to national and international organizations. He's received a number of honors, among those are He's a fellow of the Institute of Physics in the UK. He's a member, elected member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's also an elected member of the National Academy of Inventors and a fellow of the AAAS. He continues with editorial responsibilities and is noted as an excellent teacher. Matter of fact, he received the uh, Gungerich Award for Excellence in Teaching here at Vanderbilt. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Gore. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in and to Ariel and the department for the invitation. Um, I guess what they wanted to do was to, ch I, I gave Grand Rounds 10 years ago, and I think they wanted to check out how have I been wasting my time in the 10 years since. And maybe you'll come to the conclusion that the topic I'm going to talk about is uh, maybe going nowhere, but we found it pretty interesting to pursue functional studies of white matter in the last few years, and I'm going to describe kind of a summary of where that's led us. So just to remind everybody on this 
call, which I'm sure you don't really need, but functional MRI is now about 30 years old. It's extremely well established in neuroscience and psychiatry, and it depends on detecting small changes in the magnetic resonance signal, which are somehow associated with neural activity in the brain. So the idea is that some, the, the original studies were done with some kind of stimulus, changes neural activity. For example, if you tap your fingers, these areas here, shown in yellow, will increase their neural activity. There'll be an increase in blood flow when we see a signal change. And we call this the bold effect, the blood oxygenation level dependent effect. And a second kind of experiment is where you do a very transient excitation. So for example, you might flash a light and when you see the light, you press a button. When you do that, the visual cortex here shows a transient change and the motor cortex up here shows a transient change. And we can plot this, this is actually done with very high temporal resolution, about eight frames a second. And you can trace out what's called a hemodynamic response function, which characterizes that temporal response to that transient change. So this is all very well established. Then about 15 or so years ago, people came up with a third kind of paradigm, which is called resting state fMRI. And there, rather than use a stimulus, you actually try to record the brain over a period of time in, in some kind of resting state. And the idea is that any kind of correlation in time between the MR signals from different areas of the cortex must be in some way connected. That's to say there's some kind of functional connectivity if two areas show similar time courses. So we're talking about very small signal fluctuations. We're talking about a restricted range of frequencies, typically less than 0.1 Hertz. But the idea is that if there's some kind of hemodynamic or bold synchrony, there must be some kind of neural interaction or connectivity between these regions. And this has been widely used in a, a lot of studies. I gave up plotting the number of papers on F resting state fMRI back in 2015 because it would have gone somewhere up here. But there are thousands of papers now making use of this technique. And so just to emphasize what I'm talking about, supposing you have a slice of the brain and you record that image um, by MR, say once every two or three seconds for say a few minutes. And so you would get, if you were to trace the signal from this little voxel up here, you'd see some fluctuations in that signal over time. This is going from zero to say 256 images. Some of that fluctuation is noise. Some of it is complete artifact. But if you look at another voxel back here and you see correlation, uh, you see fluctuations, you can ask the question, are these in some way correlated? Is there an R value between them? And if so, it's highly likely that they're in some way functionally connected, part of some circuit or talking to each other <clears throat> in some way. And so this is taken from somebody else's work in the literature. I just randomly downloaded a typical result where these are the sorts of networks that people find using resting state correlations in the gray matter. So for example, if I take a seed voxel over here, this yellow spot here, you say, show me all the voxels which are correlated in the resting state, you get the motor circuit. If you take a voxel here, you get the visual system. This is the so-called default mode, which is to do with what the brain is doing when it's not involved in a cognitive task. And this is some kind of attentional network. So people now argue about how many networks they can find this way, and this has become an entire subfield on itself. So all of that's fine. And then we ask the question, um, do we really see things in the white matter? So all of everything I've talked about so far, and pretty much 99.999% of the literature is about bold effects in the cortex, in the gray matter. And usually if people do an experiment and they find effects in the white matter, I think they're upset by them. It kind of, they, they treat them as false positives. Often you can get rid of them because they are small or they are weak and you can process them out. And in fact, in many standard analyses of resting state, et cetera, it's a standard step to regress out the white matter signal as a nuisance variable. A reason to doubt whether you're gonna see bold effects in white matter is because the blood flow, the blood volume in white matter is much lower than the cortex. It's about a third to a quarter. And it's not clear if there's a demand for energy. Remember the bold effect in the gray matter is the uh, increase in blood flow and oxygenation in response to an energetic increase need a need in increased energy use. And it's not clear how that would happen in, in white matter. 
Uh, there's very few claims in the literature and until we started looking, there were no previous studies of resting state signals, uh, bold signals in the white matter. <clears throat> and I think this sort of highlights what most people in, in neuroscience think of when they think of how the brain functions. They think, for example, of uh, these different stations around the brain where things are happening and then there's sort of these tracks between them like the London Underground where it's just where information is taken from one place to another. And so they're much less interesting. Or similarly, if you have a computer network, um, the computers, uh, the CPUs are where all the action is and the inter ethernet cables that connect them don't necessarily seem that interesting. So that's sort of, I think, a, a certain prejudice in the field. On the other hand, <clears throat> although the blood flow in the white matter is much less than in the gray, the oxygen extraction fraction is not negligible. Um, the white matter contains a higher clear to neuron ratio, according to many reports. And if you actually look, if you look at the signal variations in the white matter, they're not trivial. They are about, in terms of spectral power, that low frequency bandwidth of low frequency fluctuations, they're about 60 to 80% of what you find in the gray matter. And then there have been some reliable reports, very special tasks where people have said, yes, we can see activation in the white matter. So the first question we ask is, is it possible to get a robust bulb effect in white matter? And, and to, to demonstrate that, we can do a very simple physiological change. We can um, introduce hypercapnia. And when you introduce hypercapnia to the gray matter, as shown on the left here, so here is a subject breathing normal air and then switching to 5% CO2, massive vasodilation, you get this maximal change in so-called bold effect, and we can easily measure that in the gray matter. If you do the same thing with the white matter, you get a very similar thing. You can see it takes longer, and it's about only 54%. So uh, the bold effect, the maximum effect we could ever hope to get in the white matter is probably only about half of what we could get in gray. But there are bold effects produce, producible by um, some kind of manipulation of the blood flow and the oxygenation. <clears throat> so this is again another example of where I think the literature has been for many years. On the left is a teaching paper from the American Journal of Neuroradiology, teaching radiologists what is the basis for resting state fMRI. It's a very nice paper. <clears throat> they talk about the different networks and how we find them. And they point out, for example, Broca's area on the left is part of the language system, <clears throat> and there is a contralateral area on the right. What they don't mention in the paper is this very obvious um, crescent-shaped area of connectivity, which is lying deep within the corpus callosum. <clears throat> and if you just look at that image, there's no way that that can be a partial volume effect from any sort of adjacent white uh, gray matter. A similar idea, um, this is a really a meta-analysis of papers. Um, uh, it was actually a study started by myself and Adam Anderson back at Yale about 25 years ago, where we began to look at children who were born prematurely. And the Yale group has followed them over many years and has looked at their language development. <clears throat> and so this paper in Brain talked about the connectivity between, again, between Broca's area here and Wernicke's area back here, part of the language system. But nowhere in the paper do they talk about this which is clearly in the white matter uh, in the tracks connecting these two different areas. So even when people have seen these effects in, uh, in plain view in their data, they've often just not mentioned them or ignored them. So um, we began to get interested in this about five years ago. And just to show you a very easy example um, of what, what you can derive, uh, if you take a voxel here in, in, with, the, with the black arrow, the, a voxel in the optic radiation, you say, show me all those voxels which show correlated resting state fluctuations with that voxel, you see very clearly that it's limited to the white matter in the, in the visual optic radiations. If I showed you this image, uh, many of you would say, well, that's a diffusion image. That's a diffusion tractography image in which the color denotes the direction of the major direction of diffusion along tracks. And um, you might think this was derived from DTI. This actually is not 
derived from DTI. The diffusion image is shown here, and you can see they're remarkably similar. The image on the left is what we call the resting state correlational anisotropy, and I'll explain that very briefly. But the second thing we found once we started looking at resting state fluctuations in the white matter is that they were highly anisotropic and that in fact uh, they followed very much the structure of white matter tracks. So how does that come about? Well, imagine you have uh, a Rubik's cube. In the middle of there, you've got one voxel and it has 26 nearest neighbors. So I can calculate the resting state correlation between the central voxel and all the other 26 neighbors, and I get 26 different values. And I can use that in much the same way as I measure an isotropy of diffusion measurements to construct what we call a functional tensor. This functional tensor has got nothing to do with diffusion, it's to do with the anisotropy of resting state bold variation, the fluctuations um, within the tissue. But doing that, we are able to come up with tensors and we can do the same kind of mathematics and the same kind of tricks with the functional tensors based on bold as you do with white matter diffusion tensors. So for example, if I take this voxel again here and I look now using the the normal display of the peanuts to represent the anisotropy. In this particular case, it's the anisotropy of the resting state bold correlation. You can see that these are not, in the gray matter, they're pretty isotropic, but in the white matter, they appear to show the same kind of structure as you would get from uh, diffusion data. And again, uh, we can do tractography like so. And here's another example in the cingulum uh, where in fact quite clearly in, deep in the white matter here, these are highly parallel elongated peanuts showing that there's a distinct anisotropy in the bold structure in the white matter and it correlates very closely with what we see in the diffusion data. So those were some early findings and so these lead to other questions obviously which would be things like um, are these signals in any way related to something interesting, such as neural activity? If so... Dr. Gore, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, people are only seeing presenter view, and I've had a few requests to see if you could change it back to main slide view. Oh, I thought we did that. Uh, we did earlier, but when you crashed, I think uh, we lost that. Is that better? That is better. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, so you had the opportunity to see what was coming next if you had the <laughs> um, okay so so the question is are there both signals in the white matter do they change when you do some kind of task um, and how do they relate to the signals in adjacent or, or even distant uh, gray matter so we've begun to explore some of these questions and to start with we we've um, I can tell you about some work we've done using squirrel monkeys simply to evaluate whether, because in the squirrel monkey, we can do certain manipulations that aren't possible in the human. Uh, we can also check to see whether in fact these same phenomena occur. And so you can see here an image of, of the, um, uh, the squirrel brain, and you can see it's, um, it's got nice big chunks of white matter. Um, if we look at the, again, the anisotropy in the white matter tracks, we can see that, uh, they are again anisotropic. If I look at the distribution of fractional anisotropy values, comparing say gray matter in red with white matter in blue, you can see there's much more anisotropy of these bold correlations in the, in the white matter. So this is all consistent with what we found in the human. But one of the experiments we did was to take an animal and give it different levels of anesthesia. Now, when you do this with gray matter, you can see here, this is giving isofluorine increase in the level from 0.5% to 0.87 to 1.25. And these are the power spectra of the resting state fluctuations from the gray matter in this case. And you can see the fluctuations get weaker as you go to higher levels of anesthesia, which is shown over here. And the normal interpretation for this is that the baseline neural activity is, great, is gradually going down. The, the brain is just less active when you give more anesthesia. So what happens in the white matter? So here's again the gray, here's the white. And again, as you go into deeper and deeper levels of anesthesia, you see a decrease in the magnitude of these fluctuations. And when you 
quantify that. Here's the gray matter curve for different levels. Here's a reference material like muscle, which obviously doesn't change. And the white matter shows precisely the same behavior as the gray matter. So this is interpreted as a decrease in baseline neural activity. Uh, I would ask the question, why wouldn't you think this is not due to some kind of similar phenomena? <clears throat> so if we have been looking in white matter for over 20 years and not seen much activity, uh, and now we say, well, we can find it, what have we been doing wrong or inefficiently in the past? And so we've come up with two possible explanations as to why in uh, many previous studies it's been very hard to reliably find activity or, or bold effects in the white matter. And the first idea is very simple. Usually in fMRI, we average over some kind of cluster of voxels. We very rarely report single voxel activation or single voxel um, parts of a, of a component circuit. Typically, we take some kind of cluster and it's typically some kind of spherical or cubic um, region of interest over which we assume things are homogeneous and then we average over that to get higher signal to noise ratio. <clears throat> if you start to do that in a white matter tract, then clearly you will very quickly get outside the tract and you'll begin to introduce vo uh, voxels which are not part of that same structure. Um, it is not homogeneous in the same way. And so we did an experiment to show whether you can improve the sensitivity by clustering or by averaging signal over a more relevant structure. So here's an experiment, actually it's the result of like three different studies done back to back. In red you see the areas which are identified as activated by a finger tapping or tactile task <coughs> in the motor system. And uh, that's done using conventional block design fMRI. The purple are the connecting tracks identified from a separate study, whereby we've done diffusion tensor imaging and tractography, and we can trace the thalamic um, <coughs> connections to these areas. And then we can look in a resting state at the integrated signal from those white matter tracks. So now we have hundreds or even thousands of voxels all part of a similar, functionally similar structure. And when you do that, you see the following. This is the gray matter signal going up and down, up and down, as you stimulate the right palm. This is in the um, S1 area on the left. And this is on the right. So this is a very conventional kind of response. This is what you see in the uh, white matter track connecting the thalamus to S1 in blue, again, the red is the task. And you can see it's very similar, it's very robust, shows the same kind of temporal pattern as the gray matter. So this told us that part of the issue is really sensitivity and making sure that we only average over those voxels within the same structure that really makes sense, as opposed to doing some kind of isotropic general kind of smoothing. <clears throat> The second thing that became obvious is that, in fact, um, in fMRI, uh, usually we use some kind of general linear model. The general, general linear model, or GLM, assumes a particular kind of hemodynamic response function. Remember those curves I showed at the start when we were flashing the light and pressing the button? That HRF is a sort of a canonical curve that is used in terms of how we analyze all typically all fMRI data. And it's quite possible, we thought, that maybe that, um, that HRF is not the appropriate one for white matter. We already had some evidence for that from how much slower the hypercapnic response was. And so we first of all came up with a method that doesn't rely on using a HRF, and that's using a simple Fourier approach. And this is an old idea, but the idea is that if you do a block design, the task goes on and on and off, on and off, on and off, as shown here in black. This is a visual flickering checkerboard. It goes on and off, on and off. There is a fundamental frequency associated with that task. So irrespective of the precise nature of the HRF, you would expect the voxels that respond to that task to actually show a signal that varies at that frequency. And so we could do a very simple spectral analysis of the signal across time, and that's shown here. 
and we can pick out the fundamental, the fundamental frequency, which is the task frequency, and then say, then say, show me all the voxels that show a robust alternation at that frequency. And when you do that, you get the following. So this is using no clustering. This is simply using the Fourier analysis to avoid any assumptions about the precise nature of the hemodynamic response function. And you can see the, the optic radiation is very active, very clearly activated. Um, and you can measure that with the same kind of signal to noise and confidence as you can most of the cortical responses. Now, let me just uh, reiterate what the importance of this HRF is because um, you may recall that if you have any kind of system that's so-called linear, you put in some kind of transient impulse on the input, it has this extended response. We call that the, um, the hemodynamic response. Uh, in electronics, it's called the impulse response. And any other function, whether it's some kind of block or some other kind of time-dependent signal, that gets convoluted mathematically to provide the output. And in every GLM analysis, we assume a particular form for this. And if you don't have the right form, then when you analyze the output and you do what's essentially a deconvolution, you will not get back the correct input. So we went back and um, decided we would try to measure the hemodynamic response function in parts of the brain. And we were looking for a task that gave <clears throat> robust widespread activation so we didn't have to uh, you know, make a lot of assumptions about where to look, et cetera. Um, and I went back to a task that we did about, uh, I guess, close to 25 years ago, which is the famous Stroop test, which I'm sure everyone on this call knows about. But remember Stroop, who was uh, a Nashville, uh, Lipscomb and Vanderbilt psychologist, came up with these colored words. And the idea is you look at these words in turn and you're told not to read, but to name the color. So you name this red, you name this blue, you name this green. When you get to here, the brain is upset because there's an incongruency between the color of the font and your tendency to automatically read the word. When that happens, as shown in our old data from 25 years ago, there is a transient set of um, spreading activations throughout the brain. So this is the signal at time you see this incongruent word pair. And then at various times after, you can see the anterior cingulate comes on, these posterior areas activate. And um, we can plot out this time course and get a very nice robust um, response. <clears throat> so we re-implemented the stroke test and um, that's shown here. So this is, I think about 20 odd subjects where we found in giving this event related stroke activation task, we could activate these well-known areas and then we can use probabilistic white matter tractography using diffusion imaging to actually come up with the major tracks between these areas. So we now have a task where we know that there's a transient response in each of these areas. And here are the connecting tracks that connect these different regions. We can ask the question at the time of that incongruent um, event, what happened to the signal within these white matter tracks? And that's shown here. So these are what we claim are the hemodynamic response functions for these different white matter tracks. And you can see here, this is one that sort of goes up and comes down, kind of like the one that happens in gray matter, but it happens later. And many of them have more complex forms. Many of them have a negative dip before they go positive. So if this is the actual hemodynamic response function, and you assume the one that everybody assumes, you will be decreasing your sensitivity massively to detecting events <coughs> in the white matter. And we think that's the primary reason why in fact, so few previous studies have actually been able to find things successfully using these conventional approaches. Okay, so um, the question obviously arises, how is white matter bold activity related to gray matter activity? Um, we've never seen We've never seen an effect in white matter without gray matter, but um, the question more of interest is, are these in some way related? Um, so there are different possibilities. One possibility, the obvious one, is that the bold effects in the white matter are simply a drainage effect from, gray, from adjacent gray matter. 
Um, if they were more related to some kind of intrinsic property of white matter, that would be much more interesting. Um, and in any case, possibly this is a way to somehow improve our methods for uh, relating structure and function, structure being the white matter diffusion data, but function also now being the bold effect. On the question of whether this is a drainage effect, um, I think that's still a possible confound, but this is what we find in the literature when we look at, say, the white matter, we find these, these draining veins or venules, they, they drain to an interior system, and most of the cortex drains exteriorly to these larger vessels on the surface. <clears throat> so in fact, there's very little direct connection between the activity here, which would lead to draining hemoglobin in this direction, and the possibility of it crossing into the white matter and draining in this direction. So we don't think these kind of drainage effects are uh, rational explanations, particularly when you look at the distance over which we see these correlations and these, um, these synchronous um, bold signals. <clears throat> Another question we asked is, do these bold signals vary in some direct way in the white matter with the gray matter? Now we've done two pretty simple experiments. Um, it's well established that if you show a flickering checkerboard like shown here, that the flicker rate determines the magnitude of the bold effects in the primary visual cortex. And in fact, this is our data done more recently, but these studies go back 30 years, where, for example, if you flicker this at 4 hertz versus 8 versus 12, you will get different magnitudes, as shown here, um, typically peaking at about 8 to 10 hertz. So um, this is what's happening in the cortex. What happens in the optic radiation? Well, you see a very similar effect. That is, it peaks at about 8 hertz. And what this suggests is that whatever's happening in the gray matter, which is being modulated by the task, is also modulating the signal that we measure in the white matter. Uh, is that a drainage effect from, from here all the way through there? Uh, we don't think so. If you actually go back to our Fourier analysis method and you say, show me the tracks that have a very strong component at the fundamental of the task, in this, in this case, the block. You can also measure the phase of that signature. So in other words, if you think of a sine wave response to a block design, that sine wave can be shifted in time by a phase. And when you plot that phase, you can see here the phase actually increases in this direction. In other words, the bold effect is propagating backwards. And this would not, I think, agree with any directional um, any known direction of how the hemoglobin would behave in that way to explain that. <clears throat> so a second task we've done, uh, we just published most recently, uh, uh, many years ago I worked with Isabel Gautier, who you may know over in um, psychology, her interest is in face perception, and we did a study um, in which if you show people human faces versus say cars, you activate a distinct network in the brain, and in particular, the fusiform gyrus shown here shows very specific activation to human faces. In addition, on the surface of the brain, you generate what's called an N170 electrical potential at the time of seeing the face versus seeing any other kind of object. If you do this face versus other object um, comparison, then um, Sorry, I'm using the wrong mouse on the wrong screen. This is the fusiform area, this is the N170. If you do this comparison, you can take these areas and you can again do probabilistic tractography and from that converge to a set of white matter tracks which are highly likely the ones connecting different areas and that's shown here in green. This is obtained from diffusion data. The nice thing about this task, uh, as we showed some years ago, is if you degrade the face with adding noise, you can add noise in different levels, then that N170 goes down. It goes down monotonically according to the signal of the face versus the noise. And the bold signal in the fusiform gyrus also goes down. And that's, this is from our previous work back in 2004. This is the bold signal in the fusiform against N170. As you add the noise, 
both of these go down monotonically. This is the behavior of the signal in the fusiform in our latest data. This is in the gray matter, this is on the left, on the right, and this is the hemodynamic response to the faces as shown in short blocks, um, showing exactly what we might expect and what we've found previously. So what happens when we do the same modulation of the signal in the white matter? Well, here's the fusiform left and right in the cortex. These are the tracks that connect that. The, we, we have several tracks, but these are the main ones, the left and the right fusiform tracks, as we call them. You can see it has a very similar kind of time course um, as the signal in the bold, in the gray matter goes down on the left and the right, so do the signals in the white matter. <clears throat> and in fact, if we take across multiple subjects, multiple um, tracks in, in different subjects, the white matter to gray matter signal is strongly coupled. That is, whenever we modulate a task to increase or decrease the bold signal in gray matter, there is a concomitant change in a white matter track that is functionally and structurally relevant and connecting to that region. And it's not just that it's, uh, it, it is highly specific. This is the, actually the correlation between the white matter track, the fusiform, and all the other white matter tracks in the brain that we um, have labeled to the signal in the, in the fusiform on the left. And you can see this is highly specific to that one connecting track. <clears throat> now, I want to cover two other things um, before I finish. Um, the first is to tell you some work we've done recently with what's called independent components analysis. This is very topical and very um, commonly used now in the functional connectivity field whereby people are looking for circuits and <clears throat> rather than having a hypothesis about which areas are connected to which you simply have a data-driven method where you make use of the uh, different kinds of variants that contribute to the overall measurement to identify signals which have similar time courses but are spatially um, whatever they are you, you, you don't have to specify any particular regions um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this, but um, to give you a very simple illustration and to show you how topical I am, given that today is or tomorrow is Halloween, um, imagine you have um, three lanterns and each one <coughs> has a flickering candle in it. So the candles are independent, as you realize the, the light flickers um, with breeze, etc. You could take a whole series of images of these three independent pumpkins. And one of them, for example, this one <coughs> would show a flickering signal that goes like so. On average, it would look like this. This one would show a different flickering signal. All you can measure altogether is the composite, but using ICA analysis, you can actually separate this composite signal into its three components, which are the three independent pumpkins plus the background. So ICA is a way to kind of pick out these areas which are independent of the others, but which together are in some ways synchronous and showing similar temporal behavior. So we've tried this now with white matter. People have done it a lot with gray matter. We did it with gray and white separately. So um, before looking at resting state, this is a, uh, a task where someone is actually finger tapping. And we do this ICA analysis of the time series. And we look back and we find all these different temporal components and one of them, uh, in this case, number six, shows this kind of spatial distribution. And when you look at its time course, it's the, it's the curve in red. It's going up and down, just like the task and just like the cortex. And so this ICA analysis is able to reliably pick out a white matter component that behaves um, as an independent component following the task in this case. And this is the corresponding component in the gray matter, and you can see they're adjacent, um, but uh, this is found just by looking at white matter. <clears throat> if we do a resting state, we can find multiple different components. I'm just showing four here, and this is to show you the reproducibility. So first of all, we took 100 adults from the, uh, the US Human Connectome Project, and these are four components that come out of the analysis. Um, we've labeled them here. Uh, Independently, my, um, my colleague Yali Wang 
took 30 subjects from the Chinese version of the human connectome. And you can see that these are remarkably similar. So whatever these are, these are, if these are an artifact, they're a reproducible artifact across different populations, but they seem to make sense in terms of areas that you might expect to have some sort of um, connectivity. If I compare some of these regions identified by ICA of the bold in the white matter with regions that I can uh, render taken from the Johns Hopkins diffusion atlas. So these are structures identified from diffusion tractography. <coughs> these are structures identified from ICA analyses of the bold signal. And you can see this considerable correspondence, which again makes us think that what we really are looking at are bold effects in white matter structures, which are similar to the ones we would identify from <coughs> diffusion or other methods. <coughs> Um, quite remarkably, here's a, a, a strange finding, but I think it's quite exciting, is if we look at different ICA components, so this is one ICA component number, sorry, number 19, um, showing in three planes this area, which um, behaves as one of the synchronous regions. This is a different one, quite different areas of the brain, this one's post area. If I look at the time courses of these components, and these two in particular, you can see they're highly correlated. In other words, um, these, if we did the analysis and we allowed more components, would probably show that these are part of some kind of connected network, um, if we can use that in terms of how we interpret the bold effects in the white matter. <laughs> Finally, um, something that just came out, it's been a long time persu <laughs> persuading the referees that this is real, but the kind of thing you can do quite easily these days is to take large amounts of publicly available data, things like the public um, human connectome. And so we can take a bunch of people in the connectome, it's all been imaged by standard methods, and we can, for example, co-register them into some atlas. So we can take an atlas and co-register all these different subjects, and the atlas is a template with um, labeled regions. And so automatically we can label different um, areas in the cortex of all these different subjects. And in particular, we could, for example, get 68 different sulci and gyri from a, from a specific atlas applied to the human connectome. We can also take the same data and put it into a different atlas. We can put it, for example, into the Johns Hopkins, Hopkins diffusion tensor atlas, and that would give us an independent set of uh, structures, but now in the white matter. We can then go back to the connectome data and we can pick out for every one of these gray matter regions and for every one of these parcellated white matter tracts, we can get the resting state fMRI signal. And then we can say, show me all the correlations between all these different gray matters and all these different white matters. This is just to show you what the major tracts are from the Johns Hopkins Atlas. And this is um, the matrix, we call this a functional connectivity matrix. On the right here, uh, sorry, on the, on the left here are 48 different white matter tracks labeled from the atlas. These are 68 cortical areas taken from a different atlas. And then we've taken the resting state correlations between each one of these and each one of these and shown that as a thresholded um, correlation matrix. And the first thing to notice is, this is highly not random. Um, there are certain structures such as here and here that seem to connect or to correlate with many different parts of the cortex. Um, there are others which are much more sparse. <clears throat> this is the average of 172 subjects. We have now reproduced this over uh, several implementations, each involving hundreds of subjects. So again, whatever this is, this is highly reproducible. We can then, for example, ask the question, does this have any uh, meaning in terms of normal or abnormal brain function? And so we began to look at how much these correlation matrices change when we look at um, subject populations who have some disorder. And the easiest data for us to get hold of originally was the ADNI data, uh, the Alzheimer's Neuroinitiative, where they have uh, quite good behavioral data and 
imaging across a spectrum of subjects who are developing from normal to uh, mild, not mild cognitive impairment, late mild, fully blown Alzheimer's. And three of the measures that they have are the, uh, the mini mental status, where this measures um, cognitive impairment, and if you have a lower score, you're more dysfunctional. Uh, the ADAS cognitive measure, where you need a higher score <coughs> if you're greater dysfunction, and a memory loss. And I'll just show you the results of analysis. So this is, first of all, just the difference between a control group and late uh, mild cognitive impairment. This is the control group versus full-blown Alzheimer's. This is just, just the difference in those correlation matrices. And these are the ones which are significant after we've done all the things we know how to do on um, false discovery rate and multiple comparisons. Clearly there is a change in these correlations and it's clearly greater in the AD group than in the less affected group. You can actually then take those correlation matrices. So, sorry, let's go back to this. You can take these values across every subject and look for the correlation of those with the behavioral score. And when you do that, you get the following. This is the correlation between the functional matrix measure and the mini mental, or this is the, the cognitive disability. And what goes up positive here is expected to go negative here. And you can see there are some specific areas that seem to correlate strongly in terms of the, the behavioral measure and what we measure just as a gray matter, white matter correlation. In fact, you can take the entire matrix, you can just integrate the entire matrix of gray matter, white matter correlations and plot those for the different groups. And this is what we found as we plot the different groups going from normal to full blown AD. And this is what you find if you take the measures from the ADNI database. You can see that these sort of look very similar, which makes us think that this is probably telling something. It's not just an epiphenomena, but that in fact uh, there could be some useful sort of biomarker information in here <coughs> that's to do with altered correlations of bold signals in white matter that are uh, a new way to, for example, think about um, how the overall brain is structured and why. So I think my time is up, but I'll just um, summarize by saying that resting state signals in the white matter appear to be bold effects. Um, therefore, they reflect these hemodynamic changes, just like in gray matter. Uh, <clears throat> they are smaller and take longer to develop. <coughs> They're anisotropic, so we've come up with this idea of correlation tensors. You can also do high angular resolution methods, et cetera. Um, but they seem to be some kind of um, structure in the brain that goes beyond just the structural connectivity. We can define these functional correlation matrices that relate resting state signals in white matter tracks to gray matter volumes. These appear to change with cognitive decline when we've looked at the Alzheimer's group. And uh, <clears throat> we're interested at least to continue looking at this as some novel way to perhaps um, understand some changes in the brain. I should point out that not everybody in neuroscience thinks that this is a fruitful area, but uh, we've been able to persuade some reviewers of both uh, papers and more importantly grants. So we intend to sort of carry on looking at this. And I should. Uh, acknowledge all my um, colleagues who do the work in particular. Um, Zhao Wa Ding has been the driver of most of the mathematical techniques. Uh, Yali and Mu Wei are two postdocs who've done a lot of this work. And um, <coughs> we have some funding now from NINDS and NIA. And with that, I thank you again for the invitation. We're now open for questions, John. I see one in the q and is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so think of MS or something. Um, so Peter Martin asks, uh, am I looking at this in patients with white matter disease?
Uh, we have a supplement to go back and look at uh, previous data from patients uh, in the in the ADNI database. Um, my colleague Seth Smith is looking at some patients with MS, but with MS, I think it's more complicated because you have these focal lesions that sort of may change things in a different way. <clears throat> but that's so far who we've looked at. We, and we've had some um, work with Jeff and Stefan in <clears throat> in psychiatry, which I, I didn't include. He's got They've got some nice results of patients with schizophrenia. Um, I didn't include those, they're still under review, and I figured Jeff might want to present that himself at some point. He asked you a question, John. Uh, you showed the squirrel monkey data with the increasing concentrations of isofluorine and the signal getting weaker and weaker. Did you look at recovery? In other words, as they emerge from isofluorine anesthesia, and could you apply that to humans to get it? At what point does consciousness emerge? Oh, <coughs> I'll go in there. <laughs> uh, you, you can, I mean, people have, people, there's, that's a fairly active field, people changing levels of anesthesia in both animals and humans. Uh, and then, um, seeing what areas become activatable or, or in a resting state active um, throughout the brain. Um, my former colleague, Bob Shulman, uh, is very big into this. Uh, so I, I, he's written some review papers on that recently. Um, ben Gold, how white is white matter? Could some of those effects come from neural cell bodies in those voxels? Um, well, uh, we define white matter as people have defined it anatomically from imaging. So that's all we can really do. Um, yes, there are mixtures of cells in the residual, what we call white matter voxels. But we've been very, the, the main question we face is, are these partial volume effects from immediately adjacent gray matter? And we've been very careful to erode our regions and be highly selective and um, where possible look, you know, in deep chunks of white matter. So um, quite where, you know, where the change in bowl signal originates is, is not clear to us yet. Neil Wood, oh, Neil Wood, ah, uh, white matter activation. Sorry, I should have said Neil. I get Neil and Jeff muddled. So Neil has done some work with us with his schizophrenia studies um, and may want to talk about that. Are they related to detailed measures of white integrity, e.g. FA? Uh, well, yes, actually the... Well, I'm not sure about integrity. I'm not sure we can answer that. Uh, certainly where FA is low, the bold anisotropy is also low but that could just be because they're the same thing. Our astrocytes part of the equation, my, my prediction would be yes. I think, um, <clears throat> I think we're looking at um, uh, glial astrocytes, uh, all the other stuff that is what, you know, pe people always argue, well, you know, when you have a, uh, an impulse along an axon that doesn't need much energy, and people have calculated how much that is, and it's not much. But there is a lot of other housekeeping work that goes on that does require energy, and presumably some of those things are affected by the workload on the tissue. There's also question. a couple of questions in chat. Okay. I've got a quick one. Your signal, you keep referring to as white matter, so that means it's myelinated. Do you have an idea if there's a difference between non-myelinated bundles and myelinated ones? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Again, when we don't dissect these tissues and look at the detail, you know, um, cytoarchitecture. All we can look at is what are defined typically in, in a brain image as um, being white matter and gray matter. Well, the non-myelinated are going to be, if, if you look at from the midbrain to the striatum, that's non-myelinated. Mm -hmm. But we know the course of those fibers very well. And so we could figure out the course 
and the degree of overlap with myelinated fiber bundles that are coursing anteriorly. Yeah, I mean, we do have ways to tease out the amount of myelin in a bottle. There, there are some MR ways for, <coughs> for assessing myelination. So that might be something worth to pursue. Um, okay. I apologize you didn't get the... Um, Jenny, you want to ask those? Did you have two sure. more? Yes, there are. Dr. Heckers asks, um, does the WM bold signal change with interventions, drug, RTMS, ECT, et cetera? Um, uh, do we know that? I don't, I don't know any evidence for that. Um, we've certainly not done ECT or RTMS. Uh, we have, we have considered some pharmacological uh, interventions in the monkey, but I um, uh, haven't got around to doing that yet, for sure. And uh, uh, doc oh, sorry, Dr. Cassio had a question as well. It says the bulk of the white, so white matter is highly called the gray matter, but the ICA suggests it may not be just an epiphenomenon. What would be the physiological basis in the white matter that contributes independent things like cognitive decline? Uh, in the, well, I think, you know, if, if the white matter, there's a lot of evidence that I, I, I've been reading papers about changes in white matter in dementia and um, uh, AD. Um, I think there are distinct changes in the microvasculature in white matter that could lead to changes in the integrity of the white matter performing in some way. <clears throat> I think that's an area that, you know, a number of people are, are following. Um, but I, as I tell people, you know, I, I, I'm a physicist and I just collect data and then I rely on people to tell me what it is I'm looking at. But, um, I think there's some interesting questions about trying to really, you know, we, we don't have a good understanding of the basis for resting state connectivity in the gray matter. Um, so we're now trying to come up with a basis in the white matter and we haven't solved the first question. So, uh, It'll take years to sort out what some of these things are really telling us. So if we have no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. See you in 10 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>